Please bear with us for a moment while I get our live stream started for our LinkedIn audience. This will take a few moments because in a one-click world, this is something that still takes 10 clicks. Okay. Okay. Just check one thing. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go ahead with the presentation and we'll hopefully get our LinkedIn live audience in a moment. Little issue with the streaming key. So, welcome to everyone. My name is Stuart Creek. I'm a marketing manager here at Simply Learn. I'm here with Brad Geddes, PPC chair for Simply Learn, and a co-founder of Adalysis. And he's going to take us through creating and testing Google Ads, responsive search ads, um, especially. So, for people who are here on WebEx, enter questions for Brad in the, the Q and A panel, and he will be able to get to those. When we get to the Q&A, um, we'll also be looking at the chat, so put that in for all panelists. Um, but if you want the question to be answered, for sure, put it in the Q&A. If you're watching on a streaming service, please put your questions into the comments. And we're going to start off with a poll. This poll Basically, is to give us an orientation for who's in our audience based on your level of experience. And we also do a, a little check-in question to see how people are doing during this pandemic. Hopefully, we're on the other side of the pandemic now, and hopefully, we won't have a big surge this winter. But just want to see how people are holding up with work from home and all the other changes in the world. And we'll keep the question open for about 10 seconds longer. Very cool. So here is the poll response. And Brad, you can see it's a pretty even distribution of uh, experience. So a little bit weighted towards people who are either in school or freshers, but um, we have a substantial number of folks with 10 years or more of experience in the audience today. And uh, very heartening to see that almost everybody is doing well. Uh, so with that, I'm going to switch over and allow you to take control of the presentation. So I'll stop sharing the screen here. I will give you screen control. Go. And there you go. And let me, and move let me go grab the control panel so I can actually see everything. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Just to check, you can see me and you can see the presentation. Everything is good. Yes. All right. <clears throat> so, everyone, I'm Brad Geddes. I've been doing paid search for uh, too many years at this point in time. I'm 24. Um, and, you know, I'm the, the chair at Simply Learn for paid search. And today we're going to talk about creating and testing responses to search ads. Um, about six months ago, we did a webinar on how to add the transition from expanded text to ads to RSAs. And since then, we've learned more. We have even more data. So we're going to look through now how to create them, what we know today, and then how to test them, because that's the next evolution of RSAs. 
But just to kind of get everyone to speed of how we got here, right? So we, we look at ads, we think of just ads in general, right? Ads are really the lifeblood of a paid search account. It's the only part of a, your account that a user actually sees, right? Searchers don't know your keywords, your search terms, your bids, anything else, right? The ad is that connection point. It's actually one of the most important parts of the entire paid search account. And so we look back to when Google launched, which was 2002 is when, you know, Google AdWords launched. And it was text ads with a single headline and two descriptions. And this is what we had for 14 years. So most of the testing was done with descriptions, which weren't looked at much. You had one big bolded headline. You could do some testing with it, but it was one and a couple of descriptions. And, and then six years ago, in 2016, Google launched the expanded text ads, or ETAs as we call them. Right? They added a third headline. It rarely actually shows anymore. We'll talk about a little bit later. They had a second description, more ad extensions. But then we had right, several years to really test ETAs. Now, Google launched RSAs initially in 2018. Now, they were not they're mostly beta for a couple of years and it really was 2020 that most people could use the rsas and, and earlier this year right google made rsa the default ad format now the, the thing with rsas which is so different is it's all based on machine learning right you give google assets you say hey go learn stuff for us etas are based upon marketer thought right what do you think how do users interact control every detail and these are really far different on the spectrum, right? Versus, hey, I get to control what a user sees when they type in this exact search term. So I can make sure that I'm promoting my goals for success. I'm using calls to action, identify the consumer. I can direct them to take action. I can shape this exactly as I want for that search term. Then we have RSAs, which is, hey, Google, here's a bunch of headlines and descriptions, and you figure out what the user wants. And, and sometimes there's a hybrid model, which we're going to get to with that. And so often what we're thinking about is how do we take what we learned from ETAs? Because what RSA is their end format, as Google's trying to talk to my phone, at the end format of what RSAs look like to the user is the same as an ETA. It's you know, a couple of headlines, a description, maybe two descriptions, and ad extensions. So the end user, right, the searcher, doesn't see a difference in these two ad formats. Right? The difference really comes on the marketing side of what you're creating and then how the user gets to see that end product. And, and so all RSAs are, hey, Google, here's a bunch of headlines, here's some descriptions, go mix and match stuff for me. And, and when we look at how most people are creating RSAs, which are, here are you know a bunch of random lines that related to my keywords in the ad group, maybe there's some calls to action, maybe there's some benefit statements, they put them out there and they see their data gets worse. We, we, our, our system has over a billion ads in it. We look at all kinds of data in different ways. And when we look across you know, ad groups that have an ETA and an RSA in them with at least X number of impressions and so forth, ETAs win in every metric possible. And, and you look at this and you say, then why do we want RSAs? Well, RSAs are, are the new machine learning model, right? And, and Google loves machine learning. And often when Google launches something new machine learning, it takes three to five years before it's really good. Um, we look at CPA bidding, which when Google first launched it the first couple of years, it was really bad. Now, you don't even think twice before you turn on CPA bidding for a new account. Hey, Google, I want $20 CPAs. Go, go make the math happen. And they're really good at it now. And, and so often in this whole world of machine learning, the humans still know what's going on, right? You're, you're the marketer. You understand context. You understand how to connect with people. Machines don't really know how to talk to people, right? They're math-based. And so we look at why RSAs are so inconsistent. It's because a machine doesn't know how to construct an ad based upon the user context. Machines construct ads based upon what they think may be good or how other people wrote them and then use math to decide, right? hey, this combination is doing better. So we should use that more often. So what happens if you've got you know, RSAs 
and your assets are, you know, five launch related to the ad group, five benefits, maybe five calls to action. You'll have some ads that are just three calls to action as headlines. You'll have some ads that maybe have a couple benefits and headline three is related to the ad group. You'll have others that are a benefit and CTA never talked to the user and why they searched, right? We often think our, our first step of an ad is someone says, hey, I want this. And your ad says, hey, come look at me. I have this, right? That's that related to ad group line. And, and so the machine's got to go and figure out, what if I do three lines? What if I do two lines? Two is way more common, by the way. And, and what should I show? Now, we know from years of data, years and years of data, right, that what works really well in an ad is headline one saying, related to the ad group's keywords, we know what you want, let's echo the user statements, right, with some of their context around it. Headline two, a benefit or call to action. Headline three, it doesn't always show, so maybe we support headline two or put an authority statement in there. Right? So we know this works. Humans know this. The machine has to learn this because it doesn't know that's a call to action. It doesn't know this is an authority statement. And, and so that's one of the biggest problems is machines have to learn this, which is fine. The, the second biggest problem is in the creation of the RSAs where someone will put in 10 lines related to the ad group, a single call to action, and a single benefit statement. Okay, that's 12 lines. There's a couple thousand combinations possible there. So the machine has to go through many combinations to realize, oh, that single benefit and single com and single CTA, I should show more often. But it's going to have a whole lot of random looking ads to get that far. So that consistency, which we'll, we'll get into later, um, on creation of the assets themselves is important. I'm going to use the word asset. That's what Google calls it. It's just the headlines you give them. Now, step problem two with the RSAs is that someone will use the same RSA in every ad group in a campaign. Because Google's story is, give us a bunch of lines. We'll look at what the user searched for. We'll look at all of our data behind the scenes. And we'll just make these ads that work great for you every time. Now, if you're using the same ad in every ad group, then you're probably not really thinking about the user search for these sets of terms. We should show these types of ads. Right? And that gives us to our, our third reason that RSAs often fail. And again, this is not a Google problem. Um, it's a Google messaging problem of how they had the story of RSAs. It, it's the ad group creation. So because Google sort of said, hey, give us your keywords and your assets and we'll make this happen. You'll see ad groups now where the keywords are NYC dog friendly hotel, uh, downtown NYC hotel, Times Square hotel, hotels near Javits. All right. And then they, the user's like, okay, so I've got a keyword that says NYC dog friendly hotel. Let me make sure one of my assets says dog friendly hotel. And I have Times Square hotel. So let me make sure that, you know, I have an asset that also says Times Square. And of course, I want a call to action. So I add book now. Um, I want something fun. So I say, you know, find your dream hotel or enjoy staying in New York City and, and I'm done. Now, the problem here is that someone can search New York dog friendly hotel and the ad says find hotels near Javits Center. Or someone searches for hotels near Javits Center and they see an ad that says dog friendly hotel. Right? Google is not really matching up the keywords and the assets individually um, and how they're doing this creation. And so, in fact, in this ad group, the by far highest impression word was New York friendly, New York City dog friendly hotel. By far their highest impression word. The assets with the most impressions of what Google's making ads for were Times Square Hotel and Hotels near Javits. Mismatch. Just by taking these keywords and making these into four ad groups and then splitting up those RSA assets to be a little more um, friendly to the keywords in those ad groups. This single ad group saw over a 200% increase in conversion rates, increase in click-through rate, just by making more granular ad groups. And so this is something that years ago, for all of you who've been here 10 years, right? You heard granular ad groups, granular ad groups. You've heard this for years. But the, the story recently has been, hey, you don't need all these granular ad groups. Now, we're not talking about segmenting ad groups by match types and all these things. You don't need to do that. But when you think of 
these sets of keywords are related to these sets of assets. If I have a keyword that is not related to all the assets in my ad, it should be a different ad group. That is really still a very important part of organization. So next, right, we think about where's the user in the funnel? Because you're going to write ads differently for someone who doesn't know about you and awareness interest versus they're in the buy phase. So we look at where they are in the funnel, and then we think about our features and benefits, right? Features, true facts, bullet point lists about a product. Benefits, what you get out of it. Right? Pretty, pretty simple marketing statements. Now, when we think about the funnel, though, should we focus more on the benefits versus the features? It goes back to our keywords and where they sit in the funnel. So this is an important part of thinking through in your assets, should you focus on benefits or features? And you could use authority statements and, and so forth too. Same with call to action. Again, most calls to action on the web are terrible. It's subscribe now, shop now, buy now, find your product, blah, blah, blah. Right? And, and you've seen all these so many times, you just ignore them these days. So changing up your calls to action just a little bit can make a big difference. It stands out so much more. But it's not always about the call to action itself. Right? It, it's also about where's the user in the funnel versus buy now. If someone's ready to buy this day, like someone's like lowest price on product number part, right? they're, they're ready to buy this moment, right? You want to say, we had lowest price in here, buy, buy this right now. What you don't want to say is, hey, learn more about this product when they're at that buy phase, right? You want to connect these together. So when we look at, you know, what is the percentage of, of Conversion per impression winning ads by the ETA layout, because ETAs, we know all the stats by layout. RSA is Google doesn't give you this data. Right? We can easily tell that mixing calls to action and benefits along with a line that says we're you know, related to your keywords, by far the most powerful. Mixing CTA and features, second most powerful. So when we think about our asset creation, often we're thinking about is we want two, maybe three, Headlines related to the ad group, the keywords in the ad group. We want to, again, if you're making three for ad group, make three calls to action. And then three USP or authority statements. And then a few benefit statements. We want to mix and match these so that we have a consistent usage of what's related to ad group, calls to action, authority, and benefits. So that way the machine, even if it's randomly grabbing lines to initially test, is going to get something a bit more consistent in its usage touch of math. So we think about how many combinations these RSAs could be. So Google generally displays two headlines. They sometimes display three headlines. So if you make 15 RSA headlines and Google is showing two headlines, you have 210 combinations. If they're showing three headlines, you have 2,700 combinations. If you're now bringing the descriptions into play, and you say, all right, so how often does Google show 15 headlines and, or sorry, show three headlines and two descriptions? And then we've got our, they showed three headlines and one description. If with 15 headlines and two descriptions, there are four descriptions, there are 47,000 possible combinations. Now, let's think about that. 47,000 combinations if you give Google other assets. So if your ad group gets 1,000 impressions a month, after 47 months, almost four years, each combination could have one impression. Now, if we think about ad testing, right? And because that's what we're going to get into. We say we want at least 100 impressions to do ad testing. Now, granted, you should have more for statistical significance, but let's just say we want 100. That means in 4,700 years from now, all our combinations would have 100 impressions. Now, of course, the Google can't serve this way. They know they can't. So they're never going to serve all 47,000 combinations. They're going to serve a few, start looking at what seems to get better click the rates and maybe conversion rates, and lean more towards those and not show most of your combinations. We, we see people who have more than a million impressions a month and they still have less than 100 combinations. So this is what's possible, but Google knows that, hey, we can't actually do this because no one's going to look at their app from now. Therefore, 
we need to make some guesses. So you have a machine making guesses on how humans interact with, with advertising, right? Which can sometimes be problematic. So then if you have ad groups that are getting 30 and 40,000 impressions a month, right? Google generally does a good job after a few months, but more often than not, they do. When you have ad groups with a few hundred impressions or only a few thousand impressions a month, what you generally see are, are things like this where you've got an ad that is by far the winner in every single metric, our top ad here. And it's been shown 1,400 times in the past month. We have another ad that's kind of in the middle of everything. It's been shown four times as often. So what it's really common to see when you have ad groups with you know, 10 to 15,000 or less impressions per month is that what you often consider the best ad is not what gets displayed the most. So we need to fix this, right? I mean, in the end, marketers, okay, it's how Google does it, but we need to fix this for ourselves because we can't always rely on machine learning to learn all this for us right now. Will the machine learning get better at context and putting things together? Absolutely. Will it be this year? I mean, that's two months left. No. Will it be next year? A little better, but it might be a few years still like most machine learning algorithms. So where the human comes in, right, is saying, okay, Google, we're going to use your responsive search ads. We don't have a choice. But we can, we can reduce the combinations possible and we can put things in a better context. Sorry, my phone wants to keep Google on my phone. It keeps wanting to talk to me. Um, and, and so our goal here, right, is to say, let's use machine learning. Let's use our brain because we're making a better combination. Pinning comes into play. With pinning, you can tell Google, I've got these lines and I want them to show in position one or position two or three. Now, you can have one line pinned to position, meaning when this ad is served, this line, this asset will always be in this position. You can pin four lines to a single position. In that case, you're telling Google, hey, you can put any line in this position you want to of these four. You can rotate to these four. So if we have three lines pinned to the ad group, we have three lines pinned to headline two, maybe calls to action. We have three lines pinned to our headline three for authority statements, right? There's 27 combinations possible here uh, if three headlines are displayed. But so we're letting Google learn within our human created framework. So this is how these combinations get changed. If you have 15 headlines, and this is the assumption Google's only going to show two headlines, which is by far the most common. If, if we have 15 headlines, two combinations shown, no pinning, right? That's 210 combinations. If we pin one line, that becomes 14 combinations. Now, if we pin two lines, right, to that particular position, we're doubling these so we could easily get into, you know, two or three lines to each of these lines. But the math goes from, you know, 47,000 combinations to a couple hundred, Right? And so this is a way you can use both machine learning right, and the way the humans have learned, hey, this works over time um, to create these ads. Now, as you do this, you're going to see your ad strength plummet. And ad strength is Google's metric that says how great your RSA is. Now, all the ad strength really does is tell Google how much control does Google get. The less control Google gets, the lower your ad strength is. Ad strength does not affect quality score. Your bid, your CPC, your conversion rate, right? All ad strength does is tell Google how much they get to play. And if you take too much control, Google says it's bad. So you give them more ad serving control. So for instance, if we say we've got ad groups with two RSAs with different ad strengths, Oddly enough, the lower ad strength often has a higher CTR and a higher conversion rate because the human took some more control and they're usually better than machine. Now, what ad strength does is if you have two RSAs in an ad group, you can only have three maximum. If you have two RSAs in an ad group and they have different ad strengths, 
the higher ad strength ad generally gets more impressions because Google gets to play more, they like to control, therefore they will serve it more often. Doesn't affect anything else. So don't be afraid to pin. If your reps tell you, hey, pinning lowers ad strength, your answer should be, it doesn't matter. If we get better conversion rates, we don't really care about ad strength. It doesn't affect our account in any single way. So when we think about pinning, right? Well, we could pin two or three lines to H1 for, for ad relevance and just have a little bit of pin, let Google play the rest. We could pin two to three lines to every headline. We could say we want to create themes. We've got ad one with discounts. We're going to pin two or three lines to headline two with discounts and let Google create the rest. We're going to take another RSA. We'll pin some, you know, return policies or something, a different one. And we're just testing, should we focus on the discounts, the prices, the return policies, the free shipping, what matters more in our headline two theme? Right? Or you could complete, you know, if you have a lot of legal and brand, you're often going to pin a single line to H2 or H3. That's the tagline of brand, um, especially if they're trying to coordinate TV commercials with, with search ads. So if you're creating completely unpinned ads, you're like, yeah, we're like Google Play. I think we have a lot of traffic then you want to just be consistent in, your, in, in how you create your assets, right? Two or three headlines related to ad group, two and if three headlines related to ad creation. And, and that's how we get our first step of creating these relevant ads. Second step, hey, we got to test them. So when we think about testing, we, we have two types of testing. We have AB or ABC testing. Um, often we just call this single ad group testing where we're looking for the best to add in an ad group for whatever metrics you want to test by, right? And, and the reason we need to do testing is in this particular ad group, they do so much traffic on the side group. Google should figure it out. If you look at impressions, the ad group with the highest CTR is served more than 10 times, actually about 12 times more than the other ads. The ad group with by far the best conversion rate. In fact, it's double the conversion rate of the ads for the most, right? Is barely served. And, and this is where looking at, at your metrics and saying, wow, if we were to pause this ad Google really favors, our ad group's going to get a lot more conversions. And in fact, if they were to pause the, the worst ad group, here, the worst ad in this case, they would get you know two, more than 200 new conversions per month. And so the machine even though they're going to optimize their ad serving, has a tendency to favor click-through rate even over other metrics. By the way, this is EPA ad group, means target cost per action ad group. So, and, and their cost per action is lower than what the top ad's actually getting for them. And, and so this is why even if you're going to let Google have a lot of control, you need to know to hit the pause button when the system goes off the rails so that you're getting more conversions in the end. Now, the other way of doing ad testing is what we call multi-ad group testing, where we're testing a theme, a line, an idea across a lot of ad groups at once. And, and the advantage here is we're not finding the best ad for a targeting method, be it keywords, audiences, whatnot, in a single ad group. We're getting more consumer insights, right? These are the bigger questions like, should my non-brand keywords have brand in the ads? Should I, should I use geographies in my headlines? Um, should I use keyword insertion or not? Or what happens if we use ad customizers for just one place, but across the whole campaign or even account? And it lets you really learn from your data. And, and so you can do these as well with labels, which we'll talk about in a moment, um, to get that bigger picture learning. So when we look at the most common ways to test responsive search ads, right? Most common is themes, where someone's got one ad in an ad group, it's focused on discounts, loyalty, authority, whatnot. Another ad in the ad group often focused on prices, USPs, benefits. And then they're going to take the headline twos, generally headline two, but if you're testing geographies, it could be headline one. And they'll pin between and, and then start to see which ad is doing better based upon that. Um, another one is just to say, hey, if we were to take full control, right, versus we give Google full control, what happens? And so this is where you usually have one ad, completely unpinned asset. Let's just give it all to Google. Second ad, you're pinning, again, one three. 
And, and so you're sort of but jump starting machine learning because ad one will have a higher ad strength. Ad one will get more impressions. You can still read statistical significance, uh, more control. What does better? Now, the, the third testing mass sets, right? We're saying, hey, here's all the stuff. Go play with it. But then you get a report in Google called Top Combinations. It shows you which way, um, when the ads were served to users, how many impressions each combination got. And often you'll see one combination gets by far the most impressions. Um, if one, two, and three, and four, and five are getting roughly equal, Google's still trying to learn stuff. They, they don't have a good idea. Because over time, one really does top combination. Take that, make another RSA, pin every line. So now you're testing all the options Google has and at the most, so why? What's the metric difference between the two? And, and it's really common among legal companies, regulated companies, um, public companies, larger, larger companies to do fully pinned RSAs. They actually don't use RSA at all. Um, they'd say here, this, this is RSA one and often do um, one line pinned each position. Sometimes I can add a couple lines, one or two lines pinned every position. And they're essentially recreating ETAs in an RSA environment. Because with RSAs, you didn't lose anything. Right? A lot of people are like, ah, Google took our ETAs away. We, we can't do our ETA management anymore. Well, yes, you can. If you make an RSA and you pin headline one, two, and three, and description one, you've remade an ETA. There's no difference between a fully pinned RSA and an ETA. And, and so we see a lot of companies who just, they've tested legal and brand red tape to deal with. They just make ETAs out of the RSAs. And you can fully do that testing like you've done for years. So, you know, if you do impressions, you know, we see if you get between 30 to 50,000 impressions a month in an ad group, and you have one RSA. After about three months, Google does a pretty good job um, in, in figuring out what combination to show to what user. They're, they're pretty good at that level. As soon as you add two unpinned RSAs in an ad group, that number goes up to you need a few hundred thousand um, impressions per month for Google to start getting a good idea of what works, which you know a lot of advertisers have that traffic in a few ad groups, often not in all their ad groups. Yeah, so second is we have our unpinned, right? So our, our ad two here, no pins at all versus our pinned line. And this is how we do that verify testing. We're really seeing what's a better combination, right? Google's machine learning versus the human who said, we're going to make this ad and we're going to, you know, regulate Google to showing, you know, these two lines in headline two, these two lines in headline one, um, so forth. So is our overall creation better? Or is Google's just complete, you know, control better? Every once in a while, Google wins, right? It's not, it's not a advertisers always win. I mean, the machine sometimes really gets it right. They just, at low and price, humans with their prior knowledge and understanding of other humans generally beat machines at lower impressions. Your gut instinct's pretty good um, in, from a starting place. And then you get your fully pinned versus fully pinned. Now, these could be one ad is just all pinned headlines, one of each. Right. essentially recreating ETAs. Another one could be two lines pinned to one, two lines pinned to two, two lines pinned to three, and you're just giving a little more control. Um, and, and so this is much more of that, we need control, we wanna do more old school testing, which old school isn't always bad, right? A lot of, we see this really common among the larger public enterprise companies. The, the, a good commonplace to start though is themes, where you're really saying, we got our headlines related to ad group. We want to make sure those show. So it's okay to pin those in position one if you want. What we're really focused on here is our headline twos. Got some theme we're testing at geographies versus over 100,000 served in a second ad or a price versus a discount. Or, you know, what if we do a, you know, buy two, get one free versus, you know, X, you know, sales coming. And so, with this type of a, a test, right, which is a pretty common test, initially, this would be set up for you're doing single ad group testing. You're, you're seeing for the targeting method, keywords, audiences, whatever's in the ad group, right, which ad is best. Now, if we want to learn this for a whole group, right, a lot of different ad groups across the campaign, 
then we get this in a bunch of ad groups where every ad group has headlines related to the ad group based upon that individual RSA. So it'll all be different. Our headline twos, they're going to be the same in all these ad groups. So we might have two lines with geographies pinned under a thousand whatever ad groups. We have in the ad group, two lines pinned to headline two, testing some other thing, a price, hours, whatever. And then if we label them, we label the ad one, geography, we label ad two, you know, whatever test. And, and you'll see in your account, right? You got label, label, label. Now you have ads, right? Consistently across the ad groups in a campaign, or it could be multiple campaigns, that have those labels to them. And the reason for the labels is for the analysis. So be, with pivot tables are a fantastic thing. And, and, and I'm not sure I've done a webinar and not mentioned pivot tables at least once. And so what we can do is say, okay, we've got, you know, these labels we're testing across, you know, 100, 1,000, whatever ad groups. Um, we're consistent across all those. So we can download our data, we can put it in a pivot table, and we can see our information by label to say, in this particular case, right, um, should we focus on the fact that we're doing apprenticeships, that we have master craftsmen on board, that we get technicians there in under 30 minutes, right? Which one does better? And in this case, the master craftsman did best. But that's where you can start to see, right, larger picture utilized. Shouldn't matter. Does shipping matter? You know, so forth, so forth. So if you need insights in an ad group, right, or you've got really high traffic ad groups or brand ad groups where, you know, this is our brand message. We have to really look at how the, the ads work to brand. That's single ad group testing. Multi-ad group is better for insights across the segments. Um, you've got a lot of ad groups with very little data. So you, you don't get a chance to test them because they don't have data. Aggregating that data across ad group gives you more, right? So now you can do some testing. Um, good for templated ad creation and market research. You know, so uh, things just to, to really remember. In creating a responsive search ad, consistency of asset usage is really key, especially if you're not pinning, right? So having you know two or three lines related to the ad group, two or three calls to action, two or three benefits or authority statements. Right? As you pin, you can break this rule. So if you're pinning all your lines, you could have a single line pinned related to the ad group. Now, that means line one will always be there. You could then pin four and headline two. It's inconsistent in your, your numbers of asset types, but because you've taken control and said, well, this is related to ad group, it will always show there. You're still in that overall formula of, hey, we understand what you want. Right. This is what you should do next, and this is why you should trust us or believe we're the, the people to help you out, Right, which is what the ad's really doing. Um, as you pin, ad strength will go, go down. Don't worry about it. Um, it does not affect anything in your account that matters. It just affects impressions in the ad group. So when they about testing in our states, right? we want to learn. I mean, we test because we want to learn stuff. Pinning reduces possible combinations. Right, there's a big math difference of we give Google everything and we have 47,000 possible combinations. We, we pin some and we drop to 14 or 28. Still a lot, right? There's a lot of learning that can happen in that. But it's now a number that even with lower impressions, a machine can start to figure things out because it has better data density. Right? With machine learning, you need, data density is so important. Um, how much, you know, how many conversions and clicks and impressions does each individual data point get, right? The more it has, right, the better it's going to learn from the math. The less everything has, it can't find an insight. And then if you're trying to find the best ad for targeting method, right, that's really what the single ad group is for. And if you haven't done much testing, then single ad group is a good place to start too. Uh, Multi-ad group is great when you need consumer insights, but you need to be consistent, right? That label consistency, that line consistency is very important. So for those of you who are newer, you should really start more on the single ad group test. For those of you who have done this 10 years, you should be very consistent when you need to be. Um, you could do either that's based on what you're, you're, you're trying to learn. All right. And with that, I'm going to hand it back to Stuart for a second for certifications. And then we'll get to our, our various questions.
Yeah, I think, Brad, let's go to the questions now. And then okay. That, and then I'll, I'll talk about the certifications. But um, Perfect. we had a few questions. And while you've got the screen up, maybe you'll be able to go back and uh, use slides yep. to illustrate if, if it's appropriate. But um, <clears throat> we had one philosophical question from Isabel. It's the Google metrics aside. What metric do you really believe sets one ad group apart from another? This is Exactly. Oh, real. And so ad groups in themselves are self-contained units. I wouldn't really be saying an ad group, a metric sets an ad group apart from a different ad group. Um, when you get into testing or what ad, what metrics you should look at to know this ad is better than this ad, generally um, conversion per impression or revenue per impression, which is, is underused metrics. So conversion per impression looks at how often an ad was served versus how often it converts, um, which takes both conversion rate and click-through rate into account simultaneously. Simple math, right? Conversion divided by impressions. Um, if there's something I'm missing in your question, feel free to to you know put an update in there, but I don't think a metric sets an ad group apart. They're, they're self-contained units of their own data, and the keywords are going to really change how each ad group gets their, their various data points. Okay. Um, we had an interesting question from Shami who asks, what would be the best way to test a testimonial in an RSA? Oh, sure. You know, headline two, theme test, right? So here's, here's at RSA one. Let's put a testimonial or maybe two different testimonials in our headline two, pin both those lines to headline two. What do we want to test it against? you know, a price or we're the best or, you know, whatever. I'm just making stuff up here. And let's pin a couple of those to a second, put them out in the wild and and then do a data comparison to see which one did better. Okay. Um, so here's a, a, a question, on the, a meta question on the um, nature of this masterclass. Kynet asks, will we have better results with pinned headlines in our campaign? You know, so... It's actually not a straightforward question to answer. If you are having most of your ad groups are a few thousand impressions, 95% of the time, the answer is yes. Um, you'll get better results with pin headlines. If, if most of your ad groups are, you know, 100,000 impressions, then Google will do a good job after three, four, five months. So the question becomes, it's after three or three months or so usually. So the opportunity cost, right? You're going to live through this period of time where you would beat Google. And then over time, Google either equals you or, or will you know pass, surpass you. But you had to go through that rough patch where you're telling the client Google's still learning. And some people you know, don't always want to do that. Or if you're in-house, maybe it doesn't matter. Um, in, in general, if you look at how Google ends up showing the best comment, always end up with a combination which is at headline one is related to ad group, headline two is called action or benefit. Uh, there's a few exceptions, but that's, a, that's the most common way they end up. So generally just doing some pinning, jump-starting the learning in that framework, you're still using machine learning, but, and they'll probably end up where you started, but you got there much faster. Okay. Um, Ankit asks an interesting question. So sometimes in your examples, you got... Oh, so you're, this is the, let me just illustrate this for everyone real fast. Sure. So if we, if we look at this particular example and we're focused on its impressions is the Google likes CTR. Um, and, and part of the reason why they like click the rate is that there's this assumption that if they don't feel they have valid conversion data, if we get you more clicks, you will get more conversions. Right, even though it's not always true, but it's an assumption that hey, if we're not sure, let's get you the most clicks possible because then you will end up more conversions. And so Google's ad serving has always been this way that they generally favor click through rate over metrics because if they get you more clicks, they'll get you more conversions. So in this particular example, ad three is a statistical winner in click through rate. Now it's not that much higher than the others. I mean, it's seventeen point eight five versus the lowest is seventeen point two eight. Sometimes they're they're in this. And, and Google, the other thing with machine learning right now is it learns something and moves on. 
and it doesn't know when it should go back to retest its previous assumptions. Um, this is really true around um, holiday season, or if we look at COVID, you know, pre-lockdown, post-lockdown, you know, and how things change so much. It doesn't know that, hey, the situation is different. I need to go learn again because this changed, right? That's what you're for the human is, is, the, is the direction. So it's really common to see these examples. I mean, this is not an unusual example where the lowest conversion rate has by far the most impressions because it's the way Google is ad serving. Um, doesn't always happen this way, but it's it, they're pretty easy to find. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um Batish was curious to know what those ads are, but uh, they're blurred out for a reason, I assume. They are blurred out for a reason. This is in... Most likely, this is in insurance lead generation. Okay. Um, which is why you ad groups in a single month that will spend half a million dollars or a quarter million dollars. Okay. I get, uh, uh, for clarification, he asked, does pending give priority? So, I'm not sure you meant priority. If you pin a line, Google will not serve an unpinned line in that position. So, if I have an asset, one asset, and I pin it position one, it will always show in position one. It's not a priority system. It will only show. So, if you pin two lines to position one, one of these two lines will always show in position one. Your other 13 assets will never show in those positions. Um, thanks for that clarification. So we had a couple of people uh, asking uh, about ad strength and just could you reiterate your point about um, yep. ad strength and, and pinning? Yep. So as you pin ads, right? Well, actually, as you create assets, right? So I'm going to actually, I'm going to grab this one real fast anyway. It'd be easier if I pull it. Let's see here. Oh, I went way too far, way too far. So as you create these, you're going to see at the top of the screen a place where Google is showing you, if you look at the top headline here, your, your current ad strength, which is anywhere from poor to excellent. And then what you need to do to get a higher ad strength. Usually it's add more lines or put your keywords more often into the ad groups. Occasionally it'll be like make your, your headlines more unique if they're really similar to each other. So... You, you got this initial part. And generally, if you were to say, we have 15 headlines, actually, if you have 13 headlines plus, um, and they're a little bit of, of varied, you'll have an excellent ad strength. Now, as soon as you start pinning lines, you've taken control from Google, and, and they don't like that. So one of your increased ad strength options becomes pin less lines, right? So then your ad strength drops. And it is really common to see massive accounts where every RSA is a poor ad strength because they pinned everything. Um, now, this is just Google's suggestion on what to do, right? Now, it in itself doesn't matter. It's Google's suggestion on how to improve your ads overall. If you're completely unpinning things and you want Google to have control, then you should go for a good to excellent ad strength so they have a variety to work with, right? The more you want to take control because you're pinning or you have legal or whatever restrictions, the less ad strength matters to you. So it's a metric that personally, I don't care about at all. Um, I, we, I look at an occasion mostly to, to see things like, hey, what happens you know, if you've got two ads and aggregate, does ad strength matter? Or you know, why is it that the lower ad strength ad generally has better conversion rates and click-through rates? Um, and and so that's where you can start to get this idea that restricting the machine is not always a bad idea, right? It's it's that right now we're in this world of humans. We have prior knowledge. We understand humans. We have we understand context. We understand when the world changes or environments change. Machines work on math. So you need to set up them up for success because they can do all this stuff that you don't have to worry about, right? But you got to set them up for success by saying, this is the framework the machine should work in. And that's what your job is as a marketer is to say, well, you can use machine learning within a framework we devised. And that combination gets you the best results usually. 
That, that uh, leads to Raj Kumar's question, which is, is it important to learn machine learning to understand the, the technology in order to be able to take advantage of it this way? Absolutely not. Um, you do not need to go get a degree in machine learning to understand how to use the technology. Not at all. And, and so the, the biggest downside of machine learning is even the people who create the, the algorithms can't tell you why the machine did something all the time. And so the machine learns, but it doesn't give you insights. And, and that's the downside of machine learning. You'll get some things that it will learn and you can figure out why or, or it'll tell you why. Other times it doesn't. So you as a human looking over why the machine made a decision or trying to figure out um, what's the difference here gives you an insight. You can use other places. And that's why the business intelligence part of this is completely separate. Because um, machines don't only know why they did something. They just know what the data told them to do. Okay. Um, we only have time for like one or two more questions. So um, Manish asks, uh, just a clarifying general question, what is the ad of a dynamic search? Ad? What is the, pardon me, what is the role? You do not write headlines at all. Get the ads. Then the user, if, when someone searches and their search term matches a part of your website you told Google it was okay to match them, then Google dynamically builds the headlines and shows that ad to the user. So DSAs are, or dynamic search ads are created by matching search terms to aspects of your website as opposed to you picking keywords. There's no keywords you choose here. It's a, it's a search term to website match. And I think uh, the last question we can actually take is... Um Rajiv, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm looking at a cautious question. Um, is there a rule of thumb for how many ads are a good number in, in a given ad group? You know what? So with response to search ads, you're limited to a maximum of three. That's it. You can only create three. Okay. Most people should not be creating three. Um, if you have, you know, three unpinned ads, that means there's more than 120,000 possible ways these ads can be served. If you are doing huge pinning, like you're pinning every single line, then you could use three fully pinned ads like you tested expanded text ads, you know, previous to, to July this year. Um, if you're doing like, I'm going to create, you know, some pinned ads, but I'm going to pin two and three lines to headline one and two and so forth. You generally want to test only two, just because of the way the math works out. So you get enough data density to actually get results. Okay. Um, we had a question from Sanjay about how uh, banning cookies will affect remarketing, but we just did a, a webinar on remarketing uh, for a while ago with you, right? Yeah, we did. Our last webinar was remarketing. Exactly. Uh, so so I, I might ask uh, Sanjay to take a look at the Simply Learn um, YouTube channel see if you can find that uh, that webinar because that might have some insights for you. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead. Uh, I apologize for the folks whose questions we couldn't answer, but we are uh, running low on time. So I'm going to go ahead and take back the stream control and move forward to the closing of our webinar. So let's do a quick poll. And this quick poll is what skills are you in the audience looking to add to your digital marketing toolkit? Leave this open for about 30 seconds. You can pick one, two, three, as many as you like for that list. All right, and we're just about there. Here's the result. 
That's very interesting because it's a pretty even distribution across all the different skills. Analytics and SEO, PPC are the three top answers, I think. Social media as well. Analytics so, pairs with everything. Everyone should know basis of analytics, regardless of what you go into. Not necessarily everything, but it's data permeates everything. Yeah. And, and basically, it's what we've been talking about today in this master class is the analytics having to do with uh, ad testing. So, um, as, as Brad mentioned earlier, there are certifications you can look at to add these skills. Um, and Simply Learn has several different programs we have. Uh, digital marketing master's programs of two types. Uh, one is uh, 14 courses that go deeper into different to topics. Another one is five courses that's a little less intensive, but it gives you a really good overview uh, still at that level. And we also partner with uh, universities like Purdue University. So here's an example of a program that we do where uh, as part of this program, you get uh, master classes with Meta, you get uh, master classes with Purdue faculty or Purdue instructors, and all of these programs are delivered fully online. They include uh, live virtual classes with instructors like Brad who meet with you weekly and take you through each topic so that you're actually interacting with the the instructor asking your questions, you can turn to your peers in the classroom in a virtual way, and um, then you have a 24 by 7 platform to do the work between classes. So uh, here's an example of how this particular program is built. It starts with an orientation session, but it moves right into a fundamental overview course of digital marketing and SEO, uh, then a more intensive course in pay-per-click, uh, the web analytics. Brad said it's all important. Um, it includes a social media marketing module and culminates with a capstone where you take all of those skills and put them together into a digital marketing program that you design um, to answer an industry aligned question. Such and such company is an airline that seasonally, so what is your plan for the digital marketing program and how do you build that? That would be an example of a type of problem that you would solve. You take several weeks with your instructor as a mentor and create this project that you can put into your portfolio and show off as your experience in digital marketing. So this is a great way to build up skills and experience. And as I mentioned, you get the uh, master classes with Meta and Purdue in, in this particular program. Um, and it exposes you to and, and makes you actually use hands-on a whole suite of different tools and platforms so that uh, when you add these things to your resume, you can legitimately claim that you have used them and you're familiar with them, you know how to apply them to real world problems. So um, I'm just going to ask a simple final question, which is based on this thumbnail sketch, is this something that you'd be interested in doing? Are you interested in learning more about the, the Simply Learn digital marketing programs? Let's leave that open for 20 seconds or so. And we have a, a number of different courses. The question popped up, does, is this a paid course? Yes, these courses are paid. Uh, Simply Learn does have some basic courses uh, that are uh, free to access. These particular programs are, are paid programs that end up with a uh, certificate from either Simple Learn or from our university partner. So um, they're very intensive and very exhaustive. And poll result. So more than half of people are definitely interested. Another third are uh, maybe interested, somewhat intrigued. So I will... Uh, put into the uh, chat uh, the link to this course. First, I want to put into a chat a um, link for you to... We have a, a Rena who said in the chat, already enrolled, and this is and it's going well. So that's a good endorsement. Thank you, Rena. Um, 
Here is a link to a quick survey, which we'd like to ask you to do about our courses. And then here is the actual link to the, uh, hold on a second, found it. The actual link to the category page, which lists our various digital marketing programs. That now is in the chat window for you. So with that, I'm going to say thank you to Brad. I will give you his LinkedIn chat. He whisper on LinkedIn. Thank you so much, Brad, for being here today. Owen, oh, thank you, sir, for hosting us as always. Yeah, I, I find that by hosting um, these webinars, I am learning quite a lot. By <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm getting a kind of a, a mini education here. But again, uh, our programs that include instructors like Brad uh, on weekly classes live with uh, with the students uh, take you into much more detail and allow you to do direct interaction. So instead of a, just a, um, waiting to the end for a chat or Q and a session, you get to, to actually ask those questions live during the class. So that's a great thing. And I'm going to, um, invite everyone to connect with simply learn on our social media channels, uh, Facebook and Twitter. We're at simply learn on LinkedIn. You can look for simply learn. And we look forward to keeping in touch with you, and we hope we can welcome you into the Simply Learn learning community. So thank you all for being here, and uh, that concludes our webinar for today.